So we want to welcome you to um, this virtual roundtable on um, equity and evaluation in, for your telehealth projects. Um, and we want to thank CDC uh, for uh, their generous support for this activity. And um, with that, I will keep it short and sweet and pass it off to um, my colleagues, Courtney and Michaela. If you have any questions or any issues, um, please feel free to drop those in the chat. We're a small group also, so feel free to raise your hand um, and uh, we can have you come off mute. And um, if everybody would also just take a moment to um, just introduce themselves in the chat, just uh, uh, who you are and, and uh, from where you're joining us. And Annette, you did not have to turn your camera off. But, um, so um, yeah, so if you could just put in the chat, like who you are and from where you're joining, um, both both organizationally and uh, and physically, if you would like. Okay. Oops, sorry, let me move you all's lovely faces out of the way. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Sally. I'm a program manager here at AMCHIP. Um, I'll be uh, presenting today with my lovely colleague, Michaela, who you'll hear from um, in a little bit. But today we're gonna be talking about um, what's next when your evaluation is done. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. So we have two objectives for today. The first is to build knowledge around how to plan evaluation, evaluations in ways that center equity and um, to build knowledge around steps to take after completing an evaluation. So today, this may look familiar uh, to a lot of you. We're gonna be talking about the CDC evaluation framework and standards and um, a telehealth example that kind of aligns with the framework to um, show the application of the different steps and uh, kind of think through it. Um, if you've been to our roundtables before, we talked about like the basics of evaluation and then also the um, equitable evaluative framework. So this is kind of the next uh, piece of our series. Um, and so I'll go ahead and get started talking about the framework and the standards and then jumping into our example and some of the steps. And then of course, uh, what to do next, which is gonna be the focus um, of the presentation. So that justify conclusion step and assure use and share uh, lessons. We're gonna be focusing on those two. Um, but there are four standards for the uh, CDC evaluation framework. The first of which is utility standards, which ensure that an evaluation will serve the information needs of intended users. Propriety standards ensure that an evaluation will be conducted legally ethically and with due regard for the welfare of those involved in the evaluation, as well as those affected by the results. Feasibility standards ensure that an evaluation will be a realistic, prudent, diplomatic, and frugal. And last but not least, accuracy standards ensure that an evaluation will reveal and convey technically adequate information about the features that determine worth or merit of the program being evaluated. So uh, moving on to our case study uh, for the session. This uh, may sound familiar to a lot of you. This was um, a program taken from AMCHIP's Innovation um, Hub resource. And this is the Integrated Services Program uh, facilitating telehealth through the loan or lending of cellular technology and tablets. So just a little bit about this program, uh, the Bureau of Children with Special Health Care Needs in Utah created a lending library of 30 laptops and mobile hotspots to be available to families who benefit from telehealth visits. The lending libraries are located at various um, agencies throughout the state. The goal of this program is to reach families by increasing access to te uh, technology that facilitates the telehealth experience and connects families to needed supports, specialists, and services during the pandemic. It's also working to improve access to care for families that face barriers um, prior to the pandemic as well. A little bit about the program flow. So we have the lending library with the 30 laptops and mobile hotspots. They also have four Chromebooks. And again, those are distributed across the state. Um, the program is marketed through hospital systems, local health departments, local primary care providers, et cetera. 
They also have uh, care coordinators that help families connect to medical providers, and they provide additional education and support um, during the actual telehealth visit. So making sure people have instructions on how to use the technology for their visit. Some of the core components of the program are convenience, so making sure that um, technology is available where the families live, ease of use, providing instructions so families know how to use the technology, and then um, pa uh, patient and parent satisfaction, so assessing families' experience with the overall process and the technology that was used. Some of the key stakeholders that were identified for this program are, um, of course, the families and children receiving services, Title V Shin, local health departments, University of Utah, Intermountain Healthcare, and the Utah Parent Center. So that is um, our example for the day. And we're gonna keep that in mind as we work uh, through these steps of the framework. So the first step is to engage stakeholders. Um, and stakeholders are people or organizations who are invested in the program, interested in the results of the evaluation and have a stake in what will be done with the results of the evaluation. Um, and so thinking about equity um, in this step, you really want to um, encourage participant ownership um, and make sure that relevant stakeholders are engaged throughout the entire evaluation process. And also thinking about um, how you can equitably compensate state stakeholders, particularly community members and um, participant stakeholders. So we have a little uh, fun interactive piece. Well, I hope it's fun, um, but uh, brainstorming activity. So um, thinking back to our example and the key stakeholders that were identified and thinking about the information we just learned from this first step, how might the program engage the stakeholders throughout the evaluation process? So during the design process, data collection, and then at the end uh, during communication and dissemination. So we are gonna do a wide waterfall chat activity. Um, so essentially, everyone's just going to type in their response to this question in the chat, but don't um, click enter or submit your response until I give a signal. So I'm going to stop talking um, and give everybody a moment to brainstorm a response to this question, and then I'll let you know when to submit your response. Okay, and Michaela, I may need your help reading the responses once we do this, because uh, I can't really see the chat, but um, if you all are ready, we can go ahead and get ready to submit your responses on the count of three. Um, so one, two, three, go ahead and enter it in. And if okay. you can't see that, Courtney, I can read <clears throat> the responses. So we have survey design for library users, an advisory group when creating the evaluation questions, and then getting input from each group. Yeah, perfect. So those are all um, great ways that you can engage stakeholders. Um, and I see some people, you know, identify different parts of the uh, evaluation process where they could be engaged as well. So. Great job, you all are spot on. Oops, I can move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, after we have um, engaged our stakeholders, we're gonna want to describe the program. And this is important because um, this conveys the program mission and objectives, and it sets the frame of reference for all subsequent decisions in an evaluation. And so um, what is important to include in this program description, you'd want to include the need. So um, explaining the problem that the program plans to address, um, what the uh, expected effects and outcomes are, um, the activities that the program um, will have any resources that you need to support the program and the activities, uh, the stage that your program is currently in, context, uh, so the setting and environment your program is operating in, and then having a logic model, which um, is that visual representation of your program components and sequence. 
So again, bringing in equity in this step, um, you want to think about is your program description accessible? So it, is it easy to comprehend? Um, you would want to try to avoid excessive use of jargon and technical wording. Given um, your audience, you may need to uh, translate um, your materials in different languages as well. Um, and then you want to make sure that the program description is not perpetuating uh, stereotypes or referring to groups incorrectly. You want to use words and tone that shows respect. Um, so this can be another point in the process where you engage those stakeholders and um, ask community members how they would like to be addressed um, when you're referring to them throughout this process. Um, and of course, you're not going to be able to please everybody every time, but I think it is still a good idea to uh, reach out and, you know, ask and consider the feedback that you're given. Alrighty. Step three is to focus the evaluation design. Um, you want a design that's suitable and efficient. And so if you've been to our uh, previous roundtables, we talked um, quite a bit about the equitable evaluation framework. And so in this step, um, it would be good for it to be aligned with that third principle of the framework, which is that evaluative work should be designed and implemented commensurate with the values underlying equity work. So that's something you'd want to keep in mind during this step. Um, as well as considering the purpose. So thinking about what the evaluation's purpose is and making sure that it, it is in service of um, advancing equity. Um, thinking about the users and so the specific people who will receive the evaluation findings, the uses, the ways in which the evaluation findings will be applied, thinking about um, who will be affected and how due to the application of the evaluation findings. Additionally, uh, you want to create evaluation questions that collect the information that you're interested in. Um, try to include questions about uh, barriers and supports that can provide information about drivers um, of equity that may impact your uh, program. For methods, again, you want to choose a, a suitable and efficient evaluation method. And then um, as you're developing agreements, uh, try to encourage a participatory evaluation design process. and um, you know, get input when you're thinking about clarifying roles and responsibilities and how the evaluation will be implemented and any safeguards and administrative approvals that are needed. Okay, and now I will pass it off to Michaela. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Michaela Fry. Um, I am a program analyst on the equity epidemiology and evaluation team at AMCHIP here with Courtney. Um, and I'll just get started talking about the fourth step, which is to gather credible evidence. Um, having credible evidence strengthens evaluation judgments and the recommendations that follow from them. Um, and I do want to draw our attention to a really key term here, which is credible. Um, and what credible means, um, it means different things to different people. And so one step to start kind of interrogating how you are in your program and organization are defining um, credibility. Um, it's just to ask credible to who. Um, traditionally, the who has been thought of as the evaluation end users, um, programmatic staff, and funders. But a really important group is missing here, and that are the affected populations and then the participants impacted by the program that you are evaluating. Um, and some steps here to um, focus on while you're in the gathering credible evidence stage is to choose appropriate and reliable indicators um, to determine data sources and methods, um, to establish a procedure to collect the information, and to complete an evaluation plan based on your evaluation design. Um, and there are a number of ways that we can start um, incorporating and bringing in an equity lens to uh, this step. So next slide. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and this step also relates to the traditional idea of evaluation um, and that cred credible evidence comes from quantitative data and experimental research, um, which emphasizes that certain kinds of data and evidence that have um, come to be viewed with value and legitimacy over others. So to bring in an equity lens, we should push back on this idea um, and how we design our own evaluations and highlight the importance um, of qualitative data, um, especially that of qualitative data and mixed methods data coming from 
um, affected populations and other key stakeholder groups. So other ways to incorporate equity here would to be recognize that evaluation has historically been an extractive process, um, that evaluation practices must be culturally relevant to a given community, um, and that evaluations should be really specific and not generalizable, um, that they should involve community in answering questions like what would success look like? So really um, tying in stakeholders and community members and defining success and including indicators um, that evaluate systemic drivers. So social determinants of health, discrimination, racism, um, and look at those impacts on specific demographic groups. So really thinking about disaggregating your results by race, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic status, age, um, and other demographic groups. All right, next slide. So here we have another just brainstorm. So when thinking about back to the program that Courtney had described for us, um, this um, cellu cellular um, lending program, how might the program engage stakeholders in gathering credible evidence? So I'll give us a moment just to think about this. Start typing out your responses into the chat. Do not press send just yet. And I'll let you know when to do that. Okay, if you are ready, go ahead and type, um, hit send and put your answers in the comment box. I see ensuring tools are disseminated in ways that are accessible to users and stakeholders. Yes, there are many ways, um, but you want to make sure that all stakeholders have access to the method you choose. That's very important. Lorraine, thank you for, for putting that in this space. Surveys and how the program is working. Yeah, so thinking about the process evaluation and all of this as well. Um, ask about what their needs are as a community. Yeah, so thinking about barriers, languages, supports, needs for service. Thank you, Linda and Annette. We can reach out to our family lead agency, our family led agency to spread the word for an opportunity for stakeholders to provide feedback. Yeah, so also thinking about partners that you have already in your system to help you um, with this effort. Um, so you're not reinventing the wheel um, and, uh, and leaning on um, partners with lived experience here. So thank you all. Uh, the next question is, what are some systems level indicators um, the team could consider assessing here? So thinking about like the social determinants of health that might impact um, this telehealth lending service. I'll give us another 30 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds here. Okay, let's take a few seconds to wrap up those thoughts and feel free to hit enter when you are ready. So I see timeliness metric system, metric system wide, yes. Thank you, Sabra. All 
boring. I'm not seeing any more. Um, but thank you for your participation here. Um, I think some things we can also maybe think about um, are, you know, area broadband access, thinking about how that might be impactful. Um, I see, yet yeah, completeness of reported data. Yeah, um, referrals to other sources. Yeah, so thinking about other integrated care. Now that transportation. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. So maybe thinking about, you know, if people are walking, like the walkability score of the neighborhood of these places where the devices are held, percent of missed appointments. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, Courtney, next slide. So this is just kind of where we've been over our last two virtual roundtable sessions. Um, the presentations that we've given have um, really focused on these first four stages of the CDC evaluation framework. So engaging stakeholders, describing the program, focusing evaluation design, and gathering credible evidence. But where are we now? So you just finished, you know, gathering all the evidence from your evaluation, you have created the first form, you engage your stakeholders, and now we are ready to justify the conclusions that we have from this evaluation and to um, ensure use and access of these results. Next slide. So step number five is to justify conclusions. So evaluation conclusions are justified when they are linked to the evidence gathered and judged against agreed upon values or standards um, set by stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders must agree that conclusions are justified before they will use the evaluation results with confidence. Um, and this all uh, lends into participatory sense making. Um, so when thinking about the standards, like which stakeholder values provide the basis for forming judgments? Um, what type or level of performance must be reached for the program to be considered su successful? When thinking about analysis and uh, synthesis of information, you know, what procedures will be used to examine and summarize the evaluation's findings? Um, with interpretation, what do the findings mean? Um, what is their practical significance? And um, what do they mean to different people? So judgment. What claims concerning the program's merit, worth, or significant, significance are justified based on the available evidence and the selected standards? And think about here recommendations for future, uh, for future programmatic um, iterations. So what actions should be considered resulting from the evaluation? Where are you going to go moving forward given this information? Next slide. Um, within this, um, in this step of justifying conclusions, um, I implore you to consider yourself asking, um, what does success look like? Um, in some cases, these definitions of success are based on organizational models and literature that have been informed by racial bias and that fail to account for patterns of historic and structural discrimination. Um, thoughtful interrogation of these standard definitions of, the, of success might look like asking yourself, um, the following questions. You know, what are the values and standards we typically think of to justify conclusions in our work? Who is setting the values and standards used to justify conclusions? Um, who is defining success? And what do the findings mean and for who? Um, th there's also the opportunity here to share power with um, participants and other stakeholders and affected groups when developing values and standards used to justify conclusions, um, and also the opportunity to engage um, populations in the interpretation um, of data and sense making. And so this goes into participatory sense making, which is the process of collective sense making and cross validation of evaluation results by all the stakeholders. Um, and this is usually organized before turning to the final analysis and reporting. Um, so making sure that you have this built in earlier in that cycle um, of evaluation. And this is where participants can discuss and make sense of the evidence, assign value to the contributions made and identify key issues needing more effort and where they would like to focus. 
All right, next slide. And this last step is to ensure use and share lessons. Um, where communication, dissemination, and implementation of the evaluation findings is the focus. So this step is intended to ensure that stakeholders are aware of the evaluation procedures and findings, that the findings are considered in decisions or actions um, that affect the program, and this is also known as findings use. And last, those who participated in the evaluation process have had a beneficial experience, also known as process use. Um, some activities that could take place during this step include preparing stakeholders for use by rehearsing throughout the project how different kinds of conclusions would affect program operations, scheduling follow-up meetings with intended users to facilitate the transfer evaluation conclusions, um, and designing the evaluation to achieve intended use. Um, this step also offers ample opportunities to incorporate practices that promote equity in the evaluation process that we have put up here on the screen in orange. And I will not read this, but uh, we can go up to the next slide. Um, so with the equity pieces that we saw on the previous slide, um, a lot of those are, have to deal with incorporating um, participants and people with lived experience. So some important questions to consider in this step as we lean on equity and evaluation include, um, who is guiding the evaluation process and communication plan? What is the evaluation's intended lesson? Who is communicating findings and why? And who is deciding how fi findings will be utilized? Um, an important part of centering equity in this step is to engage and elevate participants and the, ter uh, and the community of focus in the communication and dissemination process. This directly relates to combating two traditional ideas of evaluation, uh, which include evaluation should provide a generalizable lesson and that evaluators are the ultimate experts. So although we've reached this last step, it is important to remember that this process is not linear at all. Uh, many steps happen simultaneously and in different phases of the program, often more than once, you're constantly circling back. Um, and a final takeaway here is that all evaluations are unique and should be tailored to specific programs and communities. Next slide. All right, our last brainstorm for today. So how might um, the Shin community in Utah be engaged in communication and dissemination of evaluation findings? I'll give us another 30 to 60 seconds here. Um, type your ideas out into the chat. Do not hit enter yet. All right, feel free to put those responses in. Sabra working with the F2F, CBOs and families um, on interpreting results for the audience and how to share it and with whom. Parents of children can be involved in presenting the findings. Thank you, Annette. Cheryl, have community members report findings or host discussions and pay community members. Conduct virtual meetings um, or email to share findings, solicit thoughts from stakeholders. Thank you, Michelle. And from Linda, have representatives of stakeholders involved in, in dissemination of findings? Absolutely. Great. Thank you all. Um, and to close us out, I just wanted to give a little note on quality improvement and continuous quality improvement and uh, how this relates to ensuring use and sharing lessons learned from your evaluation. 
So evaluation results often offer rich data and information on programmatic processes and implementation. Evaluation results can and should be used to adjust the program so that it works best for their unique group of participants and population of interest. Um, this process of using evaluation results to improving um, programs is known as quality improvement um, or continuous quality improvement. Although these concepts have been around for a while, the public health field has only relatively recently widely adopted these practices. So what exactly is quality improvement? Quality improvement is the use of a deliberate and defined improvement process, which is focused on activities that are responsive to community needs and improving population health. Continuous quality improvement is a culture of sustained improvement targeting the elimination of waste in all systems and processes of an organization. So the true difference between quality improvement and continuous quality improvement is that continuous quality improvement is defined by organizational or institutional uptake of quality improvement. Um, QI and CQI are both important not only for program improvement, but also evaluation improvement as well. And you can apply these lenses to evaluation adaptation and refocusing the evaluation design. Um, mostly step three on the, on the CDC um, evaluation framework. And you'll notice here that quality improvement um, in and of itself um, is responsive to community needs and improving population health. Um, so thinking here about if you're trying to make your program more equitable, it is really important to use some form of quality improvement um, tool or framework. Next slide. And I just here uh, just wanted to quickly go over um, two really great common and easy to use um, quality improvement tools for program implementation. Um, I'm sure you've seen at least one of these before. Um, the PDSA or Plan Do Study Act model is really popular um, and is a way to test a change that is implemented. So going through the pres prescribed four steps. Um, guides the thinking process into breaking down the task of what you implemented um, into steps and then evaluating the outcome, improving on it, and testing it again. Um, most of us go through all of these steps when we implement change in our lives, whether work-related or not, and we don't even think about it. Um, but having them written down um, often helps people focus um, and learn more, especially about um, the program that you're implementing. Um, the five whys is a simple problem solving technique that helps get to the root of a problem quickly. As you see here, we start with a problem and end with the root cause while asking ourselves why, 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 why um, to get to that root cause. Um, the five why strategies, yes, involves looking at any problem and just drilling it down by asking why um, or what caused this problem. And while you want clear and very concise answers here, you want to avoid answers that are too simple um, and overlook important details. Typically, the answer to the first why should prompt another why, and the answer to the second why will prompt another, and so on. Um, this technique can help you quickly determine the root cause of a problem that you see in your um, implementation or a problem that your evaluation helped to illuminate to you. Um, you all receive a handout of this presentation um, in which I've linked to the resources, the PDSA and the five whys to um, that more fully expand on these tools and offer um, templates for you to use. I think next slide. Yeah, so thank you so much, Michaela. Um, just to kind of wrap up everything that we've been um, talking about, um, we just wanted to provide some key takeaways, um, which are um, affected communities should be included in defining the focus or approach to the evaluation and or in the interpretation of data and sense making. And then after you have completed your evaluation, you're going to want to justify your conclusions, uh, share findings and lessons learned, and then ensure use. So making sure that the findings are being used to inform future iterations um, of your program or the development of new programs. Um, and so that is all we had 
for you all today. I did want to pause and see if there are any questions um, for us or if there's anything that resonated with you um, about the presentation, um, any resources that we can try to help provide that would be uh, useful moving forward or any other um, comments at this time. And feel free to unmute and use the chat, whatever is comfortable. Okay, I don't think anything's coming up, but we have our uh, email addresses here. So if something comes up later on, um, you can feel free to contact us, of course. And do you want to maybe, Courtney, stop screen sharing and then yes. we can uh, see each other, even though, because I know most of you and I'm, I'm not above uh, calling on people. <laughs> um, so, um, and uh, I know, for instance, that Michelle is about to, Amory are about to at long last get to launch uh, a final part of their CARES project that has been subjected to all kinds of fun delays. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on, uh, on evaluating this piece of your work once you actually get to, you know, use it. Um. Thank you for this uh, mini workshop slash training because it just sticks a reminder to make sure that we do an evaluation, right? Sometimes we run different programs and initiatives and we just think it's gonna work, it's gonna be great, but there's really no hardcore data collection to see whether it works. So um, this will certainly um, remind us that we, we create, we, we will have to create one. <laughs> Um, so that way, after we've provided some services, we'll send it to um, to our clients or those who have av availed of our services. Um, so the trailer we're hoping to launch next month. Um, we're just on the final stages of um, putting the si signage on. Uh, the plan is to have this trailer in a village, uh, a different village on Guam every single month. And we'll be having our assistive technology devices there. Um, the folks can just walk to the community center, borrow the devices. And to extend to that, thank you to AMCHIP for funding this. Um, we will also be conducting hearing screening assessments. Um, now everybody in the program or, or here at our USED wants to use it for all kinds of things, whether it be information dissemination. And, and so they're like, Harry, when are you going to launch the trailer, right? And so it looks like it's going to be a multi-purpose thing. But uh, we're excited and we will be sure to include an evaluation tool for sure. Yeah, and I brought that up, Michelle, because I was actually thinking while they were talking and I knew that this was coming down the pike, that I think one some of your stakeholders that might be interesting to survey as well is um, is the mayors and the leaders of each of the villages because they might also have been getting feedback from people and they might have perspectives on on uh, you know how how it's working for their community is the frequency enough is it long enough is it you know whatever um, and uh, and you know and that could also just help. Um, bolster that support for like the next thing you want to do that the that the mayors and other leaders are like feel included and bought in. Yeah, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up because today Marie and I um, are meeting with the mayor's council. So this is all the 19 mayors. Um, we want to ask for their support in trying to locate those hard to find families, right? So um, this is what we need, this is the problem. And um, these are some of the solutions that we're offering, but then we also have the slide that asks what are some solutions that you can come up with? And to extend to that, we're going to also um, share with them the launch of the trailer. And you're right, that's a good idea to request for, um, you know, or solicit the evaluations um, and the, the, in, the input from the mayors uh, and other stakeholders, but thank you. How about anybody else? I know we, we are pretty eddy heavy as, often happens because y'all tend to show up at things. 
um, I feel like there's, yeah, just tell Eddie people there's a, the opportunity to talk about Eddie and they will be there, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> like that is not, that is like truly like, it's amazing. <laughs> like, um, so um, anybody else have any thoughts and, you know, even just going beyond telehealth, I know some of you are, are you know, in various parts of teleaudiology or televaluation or um, providing therapies virtually or not. Um, but, you know, this can all be, uh, when we have this wonderful crew here, of Michaela and Courtney and our other colleague Cheryl, who is is uh, lurking, um, we've got some really great resources and expertise here. Well, since you mentioned my name as a lurker, I just want to say, and I'm sure this is like preaching to a half choir, but um, you know, there's so much. There's kind of a complacency sometimes when things are working well, not to want to document and um, and also kind of brag about your successes. And I think if folks start seeing the evaluation, not so much as a chore, but as a testament to the hard work that went into it. And then there's so there's also a tendency for folks to look at the final results and either they were sparkling or not, but not really the processes, which may be more impactful than the actual outcome sometimes. So I would just encourage folks to not think of it as something that you have to do or and chips telling you to do, but something that's necessary for you to, number one, celebrate your work. And even if things don't work out, like you don't have 100% of this or 2000% of that, it will show the guts of what you put in it and how it needs to be done in order to be equitable and be, um, um, and be accepted with your communities. And the communities wanna hear that too. And they don't see all that. So that's what I'm, you know, I'm not, our middle name is is, is evaluation, but I'm not, um, I'm not, I didn't, I wasn't born on the evaluation train. I've learned that it's very important. And when all this money kind of goes away and you want to get it, get some back, it kind of serves as a record. But more than that, it just serves as, an, as, as a, a record of your work, you know, and, and we need to celebrate that, but we also need to know some of the stumbling blocks that folks have so we can kind of mitigate how we can meet those challenges. So that's why I heart evaluation, not because I love to evaluate people, but the fact that we need to do it in order to, to show um, improvements and to celebrate our successes. Yeah, I think so that's a really I'll, I'll stop I'll start that lurking again. <laughs> no, I think that that's a really good point. I think Brittany and I actually just experienced that and um we just submitted a couple of weeks ago the final report for the cares project which was arduous to write and also I cried when we submitted it because I realized like how proud we were of what we had done and if we had not really had to take that time to actually like write down like what happened and what we did and how crazy, you know, the last two years have been for all of you and for all of us um, and what was accomplished, like it, it could have really lost sight of that. And so that I do think that that part is really important is, you know, is evaluating is also being able to look back and be like, you know, wow. Like, <laughs> yeah, especially when something is ongoing or continuing, um, then it becomes routine and you almost forget that like, we didn't used to do this you know <laughs> like we, like this is new or this is a change and now it's become our norm but like wow like it's it's different and it's benefited us or it's benefited our community or it's um you know just you know we sure made that easier remember when it used to be harder um you know just any of those things can actually just be really important to remind yourself of the work that you've done and are doing um because it's easy to get caught in the muck of contracts and you know visits and all of that so if anybody wants to read 75 pages of glory would that report be available to us i mean yeah it, we are yeah we're we're actually there's the, so the the us part is solidly done um so we did we created a little we call them one pagers but it's a lie because they're two pagers um for each of the 21 jurisdictions. Um, and um, when we uh, 
get our head above water again, we're gonna send them to each of you and make sure you're okay with it being public. Um, and you know, if there's anything we got wrong or whatever. <laughs> like, um, so it's really like 30 something pages that we wrote and then the 42 pages of each of the jurisdictions. Um, so um, yeah, so we will be, and we'll be sending those out um, to you guys when we do that. <laughs> no gets that because we do really I mean, part of it is the other thing is that we had so much flexibility with this project that we mm -hmm. wrote a final report that we actually wanted people to read like um as opposed to you know it wasn't just an exercise in doing it so it's written in a way that we hope makes you actually want to continue reading it um <laughs> a little more entertaining than you normally get but because this was a grant and not a cooperative agreement and not ongoing funding that we have to like it's over um <laughs> like, it's a little we hope you know my my supervisor said that it was fun so well you know kudos to you and Brittany great. because i think this is like the model uh, grant project um, just because the both of you were always so supportive and always so flexible and so just to show you I don't know if you can see it but that is how oh, our that. it's good. real <laughs> so um you've That's got what I the thought it was like white and didn't have windows yeah well no it does have windows um, yeah. on both sides but uh we're working with a graphic designer so we're hoping to uh, so it's so green because University of Guam's color is green. Hopefully we can lighten it a bit because it's just like, ah. <laughs> you know, it'll blend in with the foliage. Um, yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> true. But, and, you know, not to toot our horn, but, you know, Michelle kind of reminded us that um, out of certain projects, it materialize, we just materialize with more things that extend because of the AMCHIP project. So um, like Marie, the laptops that we had procured for families who were identified um, as having a DHH or suspected, right? We were doing speech pathology therapy and all that, teletherapy rather. Um, we had a few left. So Marie and uh, our Eddie team went ahead and did some videos. Um, Marie, you wanna talk about it a bit? <laughs> Are you there? Sorry. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. You want to share what we're doing with the hospital okay, and sure. the iPads? Um, yes. So we had um, our social work help uh, interns assist us in creating uh, a video uh, for our, our um, parents at the hospital. So what we did was we, after we created the video and then we just finished, um, we did it in English uh, along with the ASL in, uh, 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 interpreter um translation there and then we also have a tremoral version we just completed and we um loaded it on the uh, ipad and we're sharing that with the families before they exit the birthing sites so our biggest birthing site is uh Guam Memorial hospital so the NICU unit is uh where we have it right now and then because of transitioning um supervisors, you know, retiring. Um, once we have a supervisor in the OB ward, we're going to uh, connect with that new, newly, uh, I guess, hired supervisor and work with her to have the same uh, system going in the OB ward. But um, so we're excited, you know, to be able to extend that to families because the reason we created the videos is because the hearing screeners were expressing that they didn't really feel comfortable talk, answering some of the questions, even after we provided them with, you know, literature to assist in um, speaking with families. And so our next, um, uh, the next part or the next phase would be trying to uh, translate those that same video into the Chukis uh, uh, language, so it'll be they, they'll be able to better communicate. You know um, what hearing screening, pro what the hearing screening process is is about and like. And if they had any questions, you know they can view that and and hopefully they you know they can convey 
the information a lot better. I know we're getting uh, better results in um, families coming into our, our uh, outpatient hearing screening, which was the whole purpose of showing that to them to make sure that, you know, this is really something important that you need to do and we really would like for you to come. And uh, we've been surveying them on, you know, what made them come to the appointment also, you know, uh, having a bunch of different um, questions because we've also partnered with our preschool development grant in trying to uh, uh, provide in an incentive because of the gas crisis and everything prices going up. So we're like, well, you know, and a lot of times we don't really tell them that they're getting a coupon, but um, I think for the most part, Tanya, our hearing screening facilitator, uh, the surveys are showing that families are really feeling that this is an important thing to come back to. It's not just because I'm getting a coupon or, or anything like that. It's more so because I felt it, they felt it was important for them to take their child to the next appointment. So we're happy that that's, you know, happening and stuff. So thank you for all the support and really, really so thankful for everything that uh, AMCHEP has provided us with this grant. No, I think that's awesome. And I just want to flag that like, like everything you guys both just shared was basically evaluation, because I think that's the other part is we tend to think of evaluation as being like this formal thing. But you know, you evaluated, we have unused devices, <laughs> like right, which is the thing you actually have to realize, because a lot of times we don't know what's in the closet, um, unless you actually look at it. And then you responded to your stakeholders, which are the hearing screeners, saying, you know, we are not feeling confident. Um, uh, you know, and in, in how we're going to explain this. And so then, you know, you devised a way to help them feel more confident. And now in turn, are finding that, you know, that it does seem to be um, bolstering people's return to care for uh, rescreen. So, you know, that's all evaluation, which it, it just seems so scary, I think, for a lot of us. And it turns out like we're doing it all the time. <laughs> so... Does anybody else have any examples that they want to share or problems that they are running across that um, would be useful to bounce off of colleagues? As I do think everybody that's here is an eddy person, I think. So you've got you've got your own little little group. I don't know, Linda, I feel like the last time we talked, you had some you were new and you were still discovering things. Yes, I'm still new. <laughs> I'm just in my third month of in working with Eddie. So um, yeah, just trying to um, figure it, figure some things out. But I, I'm really enjoying listening to all of the, the projects and things in these because it kind of gives me ideas of looking at what we have. We're in the middle of a transitioning like many states to a Department of Health and Human Services. So I'm not even sure where our department is gonna end up in terms of a office or what we're gonna fall under in terms of funding. So we're kind of in a place where we've been told, you know, we don't know where you're gonna be. So, <laughs> so, so that, that kind of makes it a little, little odd, um, but hopefully we'll we'll get some of that sorted out and then we can move forward with some projects when we know kind of where our funding's coming from. Yeah, and that can be a good opportunity too, to not, you know, when you know there's gonna be a transition of sorts to not necessarily bring with you the things that maybe aren't working or like, what if we stop doing this? <laughs> what if we, you know, what if we, uh, where the transition happens also it's gonna come with this thing we've been trying to make happen and now is kind of the opportunity to do so. We're gonna have to redo all of the forms with the new address, let's maybe make them more usable. We just had that conversation today, as a matter of fact, <laughs> about our website and our forms and all that kind of stuff. So, um, <laughs> and that laugh since Alaska just flipped theirs apart. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I've heard there are several states that are that are uh, that are combining, and Alaska literally just what a couple 
like a month ago, right, Annette, that you guys went from DHHS to DOH? So. <laughs> so. <laughs> Annette, if you are talking to us, you are muted. And you're still muted. Are you on your phone, it looks like? I can't unmute you for you because that would be creepy and weird. But I think it's star five. There is it. There you go. Okay. Sorry, I actually had a mute button. I thought it would work. Okay, yes, we um, we we did the opposite. Where we were uh, breaking up rather than joining together. So, um, and at the moment, we had actually just ordered a lot of materials. So, we're, the stuff that we need to, we're just putting stickers on rather than <laughs> redesigning everything. Um, but yeah, it is a good time to, to relook at things and, and see, you know, what you can do. And the only thing that's permanent is change. <laughs> I know in Utah, they're both making everybody move offices like more than once in the last year or so and doing the merger. So they they really have had a go of things <laughs> physical space is changing reporting lines are changing <laughs> so um awesome well i think most of you know how to reach us but um i'm putting it in the chat telehealth at imchip.org um if you um do have any questions we have another um round table coming up on thursday um with um, which will be working with families virtually. Um, our speaker will be Molly from Expecting Health at Genetic Alliance, which we're really excited to hear from them. Um, and then next week um, will be our sniff sniff last virtual roundtable because also the CDC funding is coming to an end. Um, and that will be focusing on policy. Um, and so again, you know, um, with that one, of particular interest to you guys, I know, is we're going to focus on um, really some nitty gritty, hopefully, specifics on things like, um, you know, how do we make my provider type in my state eligible <laughs> for um, billing, you know, um, as the PHEs have expired in most places um, and folks have not wanted to revert back to where they were um, and trying to scramble to figure out how to continue providing some of these services both from a scope of practice perspective as well as a billing perspective um so we will be addressing those as well and i will if you give me a minute because i cannot do two things at once um i will um, put the registration links to those in the chat as well um if anybody would like to join us for those um any Parting words or thoughts from anyone? All right. Yeah, it was it was good to hear some of the different projects and, and hear where you guys are at. I appreciate that. Huh. Well, thank you all. It's been wonderful. Um, and uh, thank you to Michaela and Courtney um, for really lovely um, work and always surprising us. I did text Eric from Utah and I said, I can't believe you're not here. We are using you as an example. Um, he is in the process of moving, um, but he said he would watch the recording. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, we're making you an evaluation plan. <laughs> So, and I know that one of the things that he's struggled with that I think that these that actually will be helpful is, is they've got a survey. Are people completing the survey? Not so much, um, which is a thing that we've heard a lot. So, um, so, you know, some feedback on how to maybe increase that will be, um, will be helpful. 
and Brittany just sent me a message that she meant to, I think, send everybody. So I'm just going to say that out loud <laughs> with more links um, to our innovation hub, to the telehealth projects that are in the innovation hub. Um, so, and those of you who, you know, the innovation hub is always seeking more submission. So if you are doing, because the other thing I want to say out loud while we're talking about this is, uh, you know, that thing you're doing that uh, you got excited about when you first started doing it, but you never really told anybody about it. Please submit to innovation hub because the thing you're doing is not universal. Um, and, um, and, you know, the things that, that, you know, I think everybody kind of thinks that they're not doing something that's exciting and really they are a lot of times like it's, it's that some of the most exciting things in innovation hub um which is our our kind of evidence-based and um, practices uh repository and and doesn't require that you have a significant amount of evidence to start it can be from like a cutting edge level um of where you're just getting started which is where our, all of the care site projects live um but it's really i think a lot of times folks recognizing that what they're doing is cool and um and that you know the trial and error that you went through um, and the things that didn't work, it's actually really important to share um, so that another project, another state, another, you know, like does not have to trip over the same things you tripped over because <laughs> they can learn from your experience. Um, and um, and that can be, uh, and it can also, again, as part of evaluation, be really rewarding to see your work highlighted like that to others nationally. So it's worth the effort. I think I wish I had done it when I was in Alaska, but I just never had the quote time. So, all right, guys, thank you all very, very much. And we will hopefully see you soon, either here uh, or, you know, on the next couple of round tables or at other things. And we are always available again, telehealth.amtip.org. We'll continue to um, answer questions. If you didn't get Michaela and Courtney's emails and you have questions for them later, tell how the amchip.org we know where they are we'll send it on <laughs>